Hi students, so um, I'm just going to finish up our PowerPoint. This will be quick and then I will go over our uh, your final exam. Um, so it should be pretty easy. I think we're almost done with this. So let me just go like this. All right, I'm just going to make sure this is doing what I need to do. Okay, I think we're good. All right. So, is the right one? No. Uh, yeah, okay. One second. All right, so where did we leave off? Let's see. And we went through this, this. Um, okay. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, we talked about what makes a movie independent. Um, why is this not switching? Okay, the indie umbrella. Right? So the point of this slide is just that, you know, these films can really vary because what defines it is not so much the style, although there are some commonalities. It's really um, kind of the, where the financing comes from and the manner of distribution. So history of the indie, we have in the 70s, we have these kind of this underground uh, film scene with these alternative underground films like a Razorhead and, and uh, all of David Lynch's films. In the 1980s, we have what are called ma uh, mini majors. So many majors are movies uh, produced by the studios, but that have small budgets. So they kind of have an indie vibe to them. And then we have major indies, which are indie films with large budgets. So there was kind of this blurring of the lines. An example of this is a, is a great movie called Sex, Lies, and Videotape, um, made in 1989. Uh, in the 90s, um, we kind of have uh, these Hollywood conglomerates establish specialty divisions. So this is what I was talking about, the um, you know what music labels do when they'll have like a country imprint. I still don't know if imprint's the right word, but they'll have kind of a sub-label -la -la underneath the kind of umbrella of this big music label. And uh, studios did the same thing. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so that was kind of, you know, technically maybe not an indie film, but because these uh, kind of sub-conglomerates uh, or, su or these divisions underneath, these studios function very much like an indie film production house. Uh, the films feel very indie. An example of that is Pulp Fiction. So, uh, and then, the, you know, going into the 2000s, uh, most indies are produced and or distributed through major studios. You might be, be, you might be like, wait, Alex, I thought an indie film has to not have anything to do with a studio. So, historically, that is true. However, because it is so hard to get financing these days, typically what you'll have is you'll have a small production company that will work in cahoots with a studio to kind of make sure um, that the film gets distributed. And, and in the 2000s, we kind of see this morphing of indie turning more from, you know, I still think that it's, it's it you know, it has more to do with where the money comes from, but it also in the 2000s becomes a genre descriptor, right? Indie music, right? You know, that kind of, that did not exist before the 2000s, that this kind of label that we have. So indie becomes more of a vibe um, and less of a kind of um, defined by the finance. Um, and Juno it would be an example of that. So why did the indie grow? Like why did these these films grow um, rather than you know the you know and you know rather than these kind of big budget studio films? So there are several reasons, and the the first reason is kind of the invention of home video. So in 1976 we have VHS introduced. By 1988 the majority of U.S. households own a VCR. In 1997, we have DVDs, we have Netflix. I don't, you guys, I don't know if you guys remember, you're probably too young, but when Netflix first came out, it wasn't streaming, right? It was you would pick three DVDs per month and they would mail them to you. And that's kind of how they got their start. And, you know, currently Netflix is huge. They have 23 million uh, subscribers. So as of 2000, uh, Hollywood takes in tw uh, $20 billion in uh, home video revenue. And this is three times the domestic box office. So what studios are kind of seeing and what, what anyone making films are, is seeing is that the, there's money to be, you know, the most money to be made is made not in, you know, movie theaters. It's after the movie gets out of movie theaters. And that's why if you think back, you know, back in the 80s, you know, movies would be in the theater, you know, for six months. Home Alone, uh, the Home Alone movie, the first one was in the theater for a year. You would never see that today. Nowadays, it's like the movie will be in the theater for two weeks and then it's, you know, immediately streaming. Back then, you know, you'd be in the theater for like six months and then you'd have to wait another year for the movie to come to your local blockbuster to uh, rent it. So, um, you know, 
it's very much the shift uh, from the focus being on the cinema from movie theaters to being home video. And that helps indie films, right? Because indie films, because they have lower budgets, they are typically not these kind of movies that people say, oh, you need to see that on the big screen. That's not true across the board. But for the most part, these are movies that, you know, I, I I personally feel that any movie is more enjoyable on the big screen, but they're, you know, they're typically not movies where you're like, oh, that's when I would pay for to go see on the big screen, if that makes sense. Like Avatar, right? Avatar is a movie you have to see on the big screen. Indie films are not like that. Um, and then in 2010, we have Blockbuster Video filing for bankruptcy, and I believe there's only one Blockbuster left. I think it's in Oregon. Um, then we also have Hollywood funders seeking niche market. So I don't know if you know what a niche is, but a niche is kind of like a specialty or a kind of a a subculture almost. So we have big pictures still dominating, but there's still money left on the table, right? So we have the mini majors, we have special divisions in what's called Indie Wood, which is this kind of hybrid between independent films and Hollywood studios that we were just talking about. And then we have the rise of film festivals, right? We're talking about Sundance Last Class. And these with what, uh, you know, what film festivals like Sundance do, as we were saying, is that they connect these independent films uh, with major distributors. So like uh, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, uh, you know, De debuted at Sundance and it ended up grossing a hundred million dollars. So, you know, Sundance and other film festivals gave kind of, they provided a setting for which these independent filmmakers could find big distributors to distribute their films. So what does a typical indie look like thematically? Okay. Focus on being offbeat and quirky. Uh, they're marketed to audiences not served by blockbusters and by blockbusters, we mean like Marvel movies, big budget movies, very mainstream movies, okay? So they're not trying to appeal to everyone. They're more likely to have am anti-heroes, ambiguity, non-mainstream values and politics, right? Uh, aesthetically, they have kind of a formal flourishes. What that means is that the editing, the lighting, everything kind of calls attention to itself rather than being unnoticeable. And an example of this would be discontinuity editing. Um, and discontinuity editing, it, you know, essentially is, is using a lot of jump cuts. That's a very oversimplified definition, but That'll work uh, for our purposes. Um, but you have to have some kind of a narrative or character-based justification for making these kind of, you know, new or crazy choices. A strong personal vision of director, right? These auteurs, lower budgets, and often they'll have non-professional -prof actors and what are called character actors. So uh, Tony Collette is a character actor. I'm trying to think of another one. Steve Buscemi is another, is a character actor. These are actors who don't play the leading man or the leading lady, right? They're actors who play kind of weird, offbeat uh, characters. Juliette Lewis is one of my favorite actresses. She's a character actress, right? So they, you know, indie films kind of gave these character actors a space where they could really kind of, you know, make their mark on Hollywood. Uh, politically, often, you know, all over the map, I would say um, Hollywood in general is pretty uh, liberal, but, you know, there are definitely exceptions. So uh, African or Black people in Hollywood, um, so you can see this very, uh, you know, the jazz singer with this picture in the in the uh, top right, obviously very racist blackface image of uh, Al Jolson, who is a white man in blackface um, in the jazz singer. Right. So, you know, Hollywood was very, very racist for a long time. Right. Um, but we do have, you know, these all black film productions going back to the 20s um, by uh, people like Oscar Michaud. We have and we also have kind of you know, big actors in Hollywood, like Hattie McDaniel, who you can see here um, in Gone with the Wind, right? And I believe she won a Best uh, Supporting Actress. And then Sidney Poitier uh, won the Best Actor America, uh, Academy Award, um, I think more than once. Um, I think he was the first Best Actor, uh, Black uh, actor to get the Best Actor. Then in the 70s, we have kind of this golden age of, of Black cinema um, called Blaxploitation. If you've seen um, Austin Powers, uh, the, the the one that has Beyonce in it, um, I forget what character she plays, but her character is very much based on black exploitation films. They were very stylized, uh, often like a crime story with like a sexy, you know, chick. Uh, uh, Shaft is, is an example of that. Foxy Brown, yeah. So you know, in the the Austin Powers movies, I think uh, Beyonce's character is Foxy Cleopatra, right? She's very much modeled after Foxy Brown. Um, William Greaves, uh, Greaves, uh, and I'm going mis to mispronounce this, Symbio, Psycho, Taxoplasm, uh, Burnett's Killer of the Sheep. Again, these are just kind of 
uh, the, those two would be more black uh, African American indie film or black uh, blacks uh, yeah indie films, and the other ones in the top bullet point are more the black exploitation ones. Um, and then we have the uh, you know the Spike Lee movies of the of the nineteen nineties and and John Singleton's Boys in the Hood, another fabulous film if you haven't seen it. So indie films gave the point is that indie films gave people who maybe otherwise wouldn't have a voice and wouldn't be, get to make movies the chance to do so, and because you know the studios were traditionally very racist. And that includes uh, queer cinema, right? So, uh, you know, queer cinema is a whole, you know, and we could even have a whole class on queer cinema. It's very interesting, right? It goes all the way back to the 40s and in kind of the avant-garde art movement with movies like uh, Fireworks. Uh, you know, in the 90s, there was this emergence of what's called new queer cinema um, with these, you know, those men- those movies that are mentioned there. And the themes of, of queer cinema are kind of documenting LGBT life and love, kind of saying we exist, we're here, right? Uh, often subtle crit- uh, critiques to discrimination. And it was often a response to aid. It's no mistake that there was almost this golden age of queer cinema in the 90s following the AIDS crisis, right? Because a lot of, uh, you know, of the gay people, you know, during the AIDS crisis felt like the government doesn't care about us. This country doesn't care about us. And so that drove them to kind of, you know, find outlets to kind of have voices, uh, both in art in politics and, and other forums. Um, okay, so uh, there was a big debate um, because um, there's a program called the NEA that gives grants to different uh, artists to make films. And um, some of these new queer films were given grants by the federal government. And uh, Congress did not like that. And so they defunded the, the NEA, which is, is very sad. Um, you know, again, still a lot of homophobia um, in the 90s as well. And then in the 2000s, we have, you know, queer cinema going mainstream with uh, one of my favorite films of all time. Perhaps my the best film I've ever seen is uh, Moonlight would be an example of that Brokeback Mountain Milk uh, with Sean Penn. Okay, so that is it. Um, I'm going to now pause this and I'm going to go and show you um, your uh, final exam information. One second. <laughs>